ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted to be here this evening to be with you. I've been assigned to talk about something about Eclipse because we started it 10 years ago and then to talk a little bit about my personal that leadership journey. That is what I was assigned to speak about. Well, ten year, today is actually very special because we're so pleased to see what ECLIF has become after ten years. It is very fulfilling and rewarding uh, to see that it is evolving to become exactly what we had hoped for. Then, there's something else which is very special. Today, will complete 13 years for me as governor. And tomorrow, I will start the 14th year. <laughs> so, uh, that is why it's so uh, significant. I started as governor in the year 2000 on the 1st of May. So, tonight is very important or sentimental to me. Well, we live in a world that is very significantly different from previously. It is ambiguous, it is uncertain, it is more complex, it's more interconnected, and there's new technologies emerging all the time. And therefore, the environment is highly different. It was after the Asian financial crisis that we had to restructure and uh, our financial system, our banking institutions, our insurance companies, and other institu financial institutions. Many boards actually were removed, many CEOs removed, and some we looked at, they were outstanding and exemplary in the 1990s, but the environment had changed so significantly. We knew then that we had to produce a new generation of leadership, and that was the thinking behind setting up ECLIF. To produce a new generation of leaders that would have a very different role on what leaders were previously, and contribute to our country and our region. Actually, ICLIF was, was, is international. It's an international leadership, and we hope, especially for our region, that leaders would produce leaders that would make a difference. And uh, therefore, we uh, set up the, the center, uh, and uh, the intention was to have leaders that would really uh, reinvent themselves and ensure that they became more effective. So the questions that we asked was, how then do you enhance your leadership performance in this new environment? How do you unlock the potential of your organization to be high performing in this more demanding and high pressure uh, environment? And how, as leaders, do you deal with the tremendous demands that are placed on you and tremendous pressures confronting you? So, how essentially do you develop your capabilities to produce remarkable results? And how do you sustain your energy levels? This is what Rajiv was speaking just now. Because we don't want to have organizational fatigue or leadership fatigue that happens. What skills do you need to lead change? How do you enhance your skills to make good judgments, actually, there are ways to actually frame your thinking and thought process 
so that you make good judgments. Of course, I've always been asked, does intuition play a role? Sometimes when you immerse yourself very completely into a subject or think extensively about a subject, intuition does have a, a, a role as well. You have that gut feel and it tips the decision-making process. And then, how do you deal with a high level of stress, uh, anxiety, tensions, uh, all what leaders face in uh, making uh, or uh, running organizations and making important decisions that determine uh, the lives of people around you? Well, um, in my uh, journey, leadership journey, I have experienced many challenging um, circumstances. And probably what everyone always has such great interest on is the Asian financial crisis, because it made all the difference. We could have become, or we could have been totally devastated we could have gone under an IMF program and become even more devastated and damaged, which our neighboring country, happened in our neighboring countries. Uh, it was very sad, especially for Indonesia, because if you go under an IMF program, you are subject to their conditionality. And the sad part is that when they implement or recommend and ask you to implement the wrong policies, they can walk away when it's gone all wrong. But for us, we have what is called accountability. You cannot walk away. Well, uh, during my term, 13 years term as governor, I have done organizational transformation in the bank three times and each time was highly challenging and the reason and the motivation for this was to ensure that our central bank remained effective in a continually changing environment and many of uh, I see some alumni members here and they've attended your program but they would have experienced these changes and the starting point for me was already there. The organization was already well run and a solid organization with high standards of excellence. But we were ambitious. We wanted to be there. And we were extremely ambitious and we wanted to be a leading central bank. When we said that, there were many who had skepticism. We going to be a leading central bank in the world? Well, what is going to stand in our way? Nothing except ourselves. We had a board that was very supportive if we could justify what we wanted to do. And I'd like to just talk very briefly about six things that helped me uh, in leading the bank. The first is having great clarity and sense of purpose on what outcomes we wanted to achieve. And this is important not only for uh, generating the, the outcomes and aligning everyone in the organization to know what is it that we wanted to achieve. It is also so that you're not going to be distracted. You're not going to be distracted, especially during times of crises. There's so much noise around you. There's so many people telling you what you should be doing from the IMF, from the politicians, from the, the financial markets. They're all telling you, you have to raise interest rates so that you get capital inflows. But you know if you raise interest rates, and global investment banks with their chairmen were coming in and telling us, Cam Dassault, the managing director of the IMF, 
was making public announcements that we should raise interest rates and when we didn't, there was more attack on our currencies. It was actually like going to a war because you have your reserves, that is your bullets, uh, being drained uh, by when you try to defend the currency and you know the resources attacking you, those who were attacking you had resources that were far in excess of what you had to defend yourself. And therefore, we saw like the Thai currency collapse at that time, and we saw then the uh, Indonesian rupiah, and then even the Korean won, and uh, the Philippine uh, peso, all one after another. And then, of course, we had a prime minister at that time who was so angry with the, the and so there was a lot of rhetoric, rhetoric about um, uh, the speculators who were speculating against us. And as that rhetoric escalated, uh, because emotions run high at that time, uh, there was more attack. And we saw write up saying that we want to see blood, uh, especially when we were the last one still standing. And um, at one point in time, we actually drew a graph. Every time that rhetoric went out, it, it, the, the currency went down. <laughs> and, and so we drew a graph. Of course, we did highlight some other events that uh, affected uh, the currency. And uh, he said, what are you trying to tell me? Are you trying to tell me that I mustn't speak? Uh, and so um, these were the kind of things that were happening at that time. And this actually lasted for one and a half years. It started in about May of 97, and it continued wave after wave of attack. And it was very frightening. Many people were frightened. The private sector came to us and said, tell us where the currency is going to settle. And we couldn't, of course, because sometimes events happened that were far beyond our control in another part of the world. And the last one, actually, was the collapse of the Russian ruble. At that time, we had hardly any economic re relations with Russia. But when the Russian ruble collapsed, our currency moved from 360 to 420. And so it was extremely frightening. Now, as a leader, I was asked once, did you ever show, were you frightened? And I said, of course, it was very frightening. And did you ever, did your staff ever know how you felt? And I said, never, because you must never even show that flicker in your eye of fear uh, because you uh, will cause panic. Uh, and that is the last thing that you want to do. So having clarity on what outcomes is to achieve, having an ability to envision, to have a vision. And I was told also, in learning about leadership, that leaders are those who are able to envision, to see further into the future. And the further into the future that you can envision shows an important quality of a leader. Well, um, it also allows you to have the whole organization aligned to uh, that outcome. And in managing the crises, when uh, Dr. Mahadeer, Tun Mahadeer asked me uh, to become the acting central bank governor at that time, and he had been discussing these control measures for about three months already in the National Economic Action Council. It was openly discussed. In fact, one member of the council wrote 33 reasons why he shouldn't implement these measures because it would cause the country to be devastated and damaged. 
and nobody would ever want to come and do any business with us. And there were 33 reasons. But, of course, there were two developments that happened at that time that really made us look at it very, very seriously. And one is, well, I already mentioned, the Russian ruble collapsed mm -hmm. and it went to 420. Originally, before the crisis, it was at 250. And we saw the rupiah it was at 2,500, and it went to uncharted territory at 17,000. And what about us? And I had written a paper, for, a note for the government, and I said that if it breached five, uh, five ringgit to the US dollar, it would go to 10 or 15 as well. That was the risk. Of course, there are many untold stories of what contingencies that we took, but of course it led us to think more seriously about these controls. But when he asked me, and this is a very interesting relationship which I've told to very few people, he asked me, to, when he first called me, to tell me that he wanted me to be the acting governor at that time, at the height of the crisis, that was a turning point. It was, to me, a moment in history for our country. That I said to him that I didn't have, I wasn't brought up with about controls. In fact, on the contrary, I was, my experience and learning was all on deregulation, liberalization, and greater market orientation. And he said to me that I was the right person to, do, to take charge of this because I knew how the system worked. And people also held me in high regard. So anyway, the upshot is I did accept the decision. Uh, his decision, and he said, we are all in it together. He announced it to the Economic Council, and we would work together. So I took all his uh, controls, and what we did was we decided to do, we recommended to him to do just a subset of the measures a very small subset of the measures that he had originally thought of. Now, how did we reach that? It was all about looking at what outcome we wanted to achieve, and this is what I put to him. I said, is the outcome about dealing with households, and we knew that there were some households taking out a few million here and there, and the answer is no. Is it about affecting businesses who are transferring funds, a few million or hundred million here and there? And the answer again is no. What is it about then? It's about affecting the speculators. They were dealing in billions. And so we should just focus on those measures that would affect the speculators. And this was how the decision was made. There were a few people who were very skeptical that he would listen to this kind of reason. But he did. He did. I think because he also wanted the outcome of restoring stability in our financial markets, especially in the foreign exchange market. So I come back to the point is knowing where you want to go, what outcome you want to achieve for the whole organization, for a specific policy, for a specific decision. That is very, very vital. And I can give you a few other examples. For example, an outcome that we want to achieve in our bank is to increase access to financing, whether it's a multi-conglomerate, or a, a, a micro enterprise. We want that excess because that is the uh, machinery or, 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 or um, that is 
would facilitate economic growth, and that is the final outcome that we want to achieve. And when the whole organization becomes aligned, whether you're in the payment system, or when you're in regulation of financial institutions, or you're the economics department, it's all aligned to that. And I would, I'm so pleased, and all my staff look every year at this doing business index by the World Bank, I think it's for 155 countries, in the category of access to financing. Malaysia has been ranked number one for five consecutive years. So we have produced the institutional arrangements that produce the desired result that we want to achieve. In Islamic finance, I told Mahathir at that time as well, we want every part of government to be aligned to making Malaysia uh, an international Islamic financial center. We know that for countries that are already financial centers, they just have to add the Islamic component. We are not having an aspiration to be an international financial center where you open up for all international players to come in. That is not our objective. But we want to become an international Islamic financial center. And that, again, we are evolving into one because every part of government is part of an executive committee that we meet two or three times a year so that the whole country will be aligned to making Malaysia that center. So having um, a strategic focus is important. Then the other thing which is very, very important is to be able to manage in a highly interconnected environment knowing what the relations are, how do you connect the dots. And when you look at the European crisis, look at how nobody anticipated a small country like Greece would cause so much disruption in Europe. Look at how Cyprus, an even smaller country, and when the subprime crisis happened in the US, they all said it was confined just to that subprime market to the housing sector, who would have thought that it would brought down the whole financial system of the largest country in the world, economy in the world? Well, it is so important to see what are the relationships that exist. Are you able to connect the dots? And I call it having a capability of doing integrated thinking. That is so very important. And one tool that I introduced in the bank was mind mapping because it teaches you how to connect the dots. How it's all, that's how your brain works, talking about energy and the brain. Your brain doesn't work linearly. It doesn't, you don't write headings and subheadings because your brain doesn't work that way. Your brain works in associations and linkages. And now, I'm looking at a mind map. The, <laughs> I have hundreds and thousands of mind maps now. I met Tony Buzan, who developed it by chance in London. And ever since then, I, I have been using mind maps to prepare strategies to, for decision making, for making speeches. Uh, and so on. And of course, my staff don't draw them, they use the software. And they, they, in, they don't prepare notes for me, they prepare these mind maps in these softwares. So um, that is one of the tools, of course, and the other one is to be comprehensive. The third thing is to expect the worst. And this I learned from the people at the Bank of Thailand when their currency collapsed. When their currency collapsed in, I think, about July of 1997, the IMF came in in early August, and they thought their very entry would cause confidence to be restored, markets to be uh, stabilized, and uh, the economy to start recovering. They didn't anticipate the worst is about to happen. And that is why in the European crisis, 
and even in the US, they do not anticipate the worst. It happens, and then after a long while, they react to what's happened, and then the next thing happens. So the Bank of Thailand told us when the IMF came in, they always expected that everything would get better, but things got worse. So this is what you have to do. Really anticipate what is the worst scenario? What is the worst things that can happen down the road? So when we set up Dana Harta and Dana Model, were we experiencing a banking crisis? The answer is no. We didn't have a banking crisis. Then why did we set up an asset management corporation? Well, in the early part of 98, we saw that banks were taking all their credit officers and putting them into recoveries. Nobody, they were all trying to recover their loans that were going bad, and nobody was extending new loans. And of course, this is the first thing that makes a financial crisis translate into an economic crisis. And uh, therefore, we knew then that we had to do something. We had to take away all these bad loans from the banking uh, uh, balance sheets and allow them to refocus again on lending. And that is the motivation for setting up Dana Harta. And then, of course, as we took away the bad loans, their capital got eroded and they had to be recapitalized. And that was the role of Dana Modal. And when we invited the people in Sweden who had done something like this, and they came, they were so excited. They said, gosh, you're doing this before you enter a banking crisis. We did it when we were in a full-fledged uh, crisis. And so if we look at the track record, the cost of the crisis to our country is something like three or four percent of GDP. The cost of the crisis, of course, the IMF and the, the, the World Bank made the cost of the crisis to Indonesia, Thailand, and they're so bitter about it, and Korea. Korea, future generations are paying for their crisis. We paid for it, we issued bonds. After 10 years, we provided for it, and after 10 years, we repaid the, the, the cost for the cost of the crisis. Whereas in Korea, they have to roll over the bonds. That means future generations are going to pay for the crisis because it, the cost of it was so massive. For us, it's the lowest that we know in history. Lowest fiscal cost, lowest cost to the central bank, lowest cost in labor dislocation, and so on, and in terms of economic growth. So being prepared for the worst and look at what are the possible mitigating areas that, and then of course, building your organizational capability. That is so important, investing in every aspect of organizational capability. And then what Rajiv mentioned, having that unwavering perseverance. Um, it is so important. Where does that energy come from to have that unwavering perseverance? And I was told in Jim Collins' book, uh, the latest book, his book, Good to Great, making your organizations not just good, but great org organizations. That is one of the fifth level of leadership, to have an unwavering professional uh, uh, perseverance and of course uh, th this comes from in a crisis that you want to survive the crisis and for us for our country of course we want to uh, uh, not be devastated and that is what lets us but in the other uh, of uh, having uh, this enthusiasm and energy and passion uh, is all about um, making breakthroughs, uh, going into uncharted territory, 
you find that excitement and it's exhilarating for you to be involved in this uh, uh, great outcomes uh, for the whole organization uh, to feel. But to do all this, you have to be able to be standing on solid ground. I was once asked, in, we have a meeting once a year in Basel where all the central bank governors meet, about 180 of us. And once I was participating in a panel and there was a question from the audience, how do you deal with political interference? And the first speaker, who was actually a good friend of mine, the governor from South Africa at that time, his name was Tito Mumbweni, he said, of course, you have to stand your ground. And uh, then w when it came to me, I said, of course, you have to stand your ground, but you have to be sure that you're standing on solid ground. <laughs> Therefore, you must know your business. You must really know uh, and have a solid foundation on the basis of how you make your, your dis decisions. Then finally, um, sustaining the energy levels. This is so vital. If you're going to, your organization is going to have the energy to strive forward and deliver, you need the energy as leaders and you need to. So how do you, you have to search into yourself and how that energy is uh, derived. And of course for us, it's breaking new ground, delivering results that these are the very exciting outcomes that generate energy. And this energy really is mutually reinforcing because there are times that I have to admit that I was down, really down. And that is the time the staff will, you know, know it and they will generate the energy for you. And there are times when they are worn out and you generate the energy and then it becomes mutually reinforcing and uh, that is how uh, one of the ways also of um, moving forward on this uh, seeking new frontiers um, so the energy is derived from this uh, excitement so in conclusion I hope that the alumni stay connected with ECLIF and that ECLIF will support you in your leadership journey. We are also looking at breaking new ground in how we can support you so we can work together as well and be mutually reinforcing to make this organization what we had envisioned it to be, to generate future leaders for not only Malaysia, but our Asian region. Thank you very much.